Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, um, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar, Tidy Finance and Assessing Financial Data, brought to you by the R Consortium. The R Consortium works with and provides supports to key organizations developing our software through grants and sponsorships worldwide. To find out all the details and how your organization can become a member, please visit, visit our website. I'm Melania Quintero, today's announcer, and I just have a few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar will have an interactive Q&A section between you and our presenter. Just step in a question at the bottom um, window at any point during the presentation and click the submit button. Near the end of the webinar, we'll have time to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so now we can get started. This webinar focuses on tidy finance and assessing financial data. Christoph um, Skush is the head of artificial um, intelligence at the social trading platform with Kifolio um, Financial Technologies AG. He's responsible for researching, designing, and prototyping of cutting edge AI driven products using R and Python. Um, Christoph, thank you so much. And you can go ahead and bring in your presentation. All right. Um, thanks for joining us today for this Tidy Finance uh, webinar. And also thanks to the R Consortium for, for having us here. Um, my name, as you as you said, is uh, Christoph uh, Scheuch. <laughs> it's a very, for American speaking people, it's a horrible name to pronounce. Um, I'm currently yeah, the head of AI at Wikifolio, but I'm also the co-author and maintainer of the Tidy Finance project. And in today's webinar, I will first introduce the Tidy Finance project uh, and also talk about why R is a great language to access and manage various financial data sources. At the end of the webinar, I'm also pleased to announce that we have just yesterday released a new R package that is available on Kran and that will that, that deals with a lot of issues that I'm talking about um, today. So let's start with the question, what is tidy finance? Tidy finance is actually the result of our struggles as finance PhD students um, at the beginning of our research career, because we, we faced considerable challenges in working on our uh, first research projects. In particular, there was a lot of data cleaning uh, involved and nobody prepared us for that. And the second big challenge is that there there is basically no, or there was no code available at the time to reproduce uh, the seminal uh, results. So it felt like, felt like, okay, why is this so opaque? Uh, why is nobody sharing the code? Um, and at the time, or in the last couple of years, prominent uh, voices in the financial economics uh, claimed that actually there's some sort of reproducibility crisis because people are not sharing the data, people are not sharing the code. In recent years, this has shifted dramatically. The top finance journals, they have some code sharing policy and, and things are moving in, in to our perspective in the right direction because what, what we want to achieve with our Tidy Finance project is um, providing a transparent open source approach to uh, research in financial economics. And recently, we also introduced um, the feature that we, we support multiple programming languages. So our website, tidyfinance.org, uh, at the moment provides the following set of tools. So first, if you want to learn about empirical applications using tidy principles as a student or as a self-learner, we have uh, the, the uh, content uh, on our website for you to, to look, look into. Second, um, if you want to work, learn how to work with uh, financial data in a, in a tidy manner, then we provide resources and also the package that I just mentioned. This is actually the focus of today's webinar. 
Uh, third, if you are an instructor or um, in any other position where you want to uh, teach students the importance of reproducible research in economics and finance, we also provide resources for that. Uh, and last but not least, our uh, platform also features a blog um, where that is open for external contribution uh, in the area of reproducible research uh, in finance. So let's dive a bit more into why, why do we use tidy uh, all the time? Why do we emphasize this? Why not just call it transparent finance? Um, we we decided that um, we want to follow a couple of principles uh, when working with data and when writing our code. In particular, we think that the code should not just be correct, um, but it should first be designed in such a way that it is easy to read for humans. So imagine whenever you code, you write, write a script, you're not just you know, coding in the moment, but you're also writing a script for your future self to understand, but also maybe for your co-authors. Um, one of the nicest compliments I've received from, from, from um, Stefan, who was also part of the Tidy Finance Project at some point was, um, your code, I can read your code like I can read a novel which is very nice because I feel like, okay, he understands what's happening, who are the players, and uh, um, this, this, I was really happy about that. The second important point is um, when you have a complex problem, try to break it down into simpler, smaller problems, and then uh, uh, write functions that solve these particular problems in order to, to solve the bigger problem. Um, this is very much tied to the third point. Um, you should embrace functional programming. I mean, this is something where R excels in um, and because it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to write functions to solve particular problems. And if you chain these functions together, um, this, this really increases the chances that, you, um, that your results are reproducible in the end. And the fourth point, for our tidy approach is that we want to reuse data structures um, across applications as much as possible. So I think that um, everybody who has experience with data has learned that whenever you get your hands on a new data source, it looks, it's very likely that it looks completely different to what you've worked with before, but oftentimes you need to combine uh, different data sources. So it really makes sense to think about, okay, how do you harmonize uh, the data across different sources? So, and this is also the focus of today's talk. So we will talk about tidying uh, financial data. But before we dive into the financial data, I think it makes sense to um, do a quick recap. What is tidy data? Um, I took this very nice illustration from uh, uh, Julia Lowndes and Alison Horst. Um, uh, and I really like it how they visualize this, this quote that was put forth by, by, by Hadley Wickham a couple of years ago, um, because he has written a paper on tidy data, what he means about it and the importance of it. Um, and just this nice quote that um, tidy data sets are all alike, but every messy data set is messy on its own way. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. So what do we mean by tidy data? You see on the, on the uh, bottom, uh, on the top of, of the figure, you see these happy tables because what the, the characteristics that they share is are that, that the columns are all variables, and the rows, uh, observations. So this is something that we will see in the applications uh, further down in the in the webinar. And if you look at the unhappy tables, the messy tables uh, below, uh, they claim to have uh, some problems that most of us have already encountered in our work. For instance, uh, the, the columns uh, are values and the rows are variables, so it's actually switched and uh, you might have variables in columns and, and you know, there can be anything goes uh, with data. 
Um, so I'm uh, particularly like the, the last thing. I don't even know what my deal is actually. So data can be really complicated. So I hope with this in mind, so tidy data, that's the concept, the columns are variables, the rows are observations. I think for economists that notion is, is also very intuitive. Yeah. Um, but before we dive into the, in, into the data part, let me quickly also show what we mean with a tidy code. So this is an example code chunk. Um, uh, it shows the R code, how we would solve a, an introductory problem. Um, so by now, I guess you're not surprised that we use the tidyverse for the most part of, the, uh, of our content. But just let me assure you, we are not dogmatic on our platform. There are also contributions that use data table or other approaches. It's just our personal preference that we like the tidyverse. So with this in mind, we, we, we're not claiming that the only way to write tidy code is with the tidyverse. I mean, we can also write tidy code with other approaches. So what's, what's, what's happening here is uh, in the, in the First part, uh, we want to download um, the, the symbols of a DAO index. So we can leverage the tidyquant package to do that, which is very nice. And you actually, the, the, what is returned also contains the dollar. So we kick out that row, we don't need it. So the next step, if we want to download the prices of the DAO index uh, constituents, we can also use tidyquant. Uh, and uh, this is all that you need. Actually, you just plug in the symbols and then can download the prices. And for instance, if there's a next step, we want to calculate the returns. Um, this is a step-by-step -step instruction. So for each symbol, you calculate a return and then you throw away all the rest of the data that you do not need. Uh, and also you kick out rows that um have missing values so just for completeness and this will be just very very briefly we'll not go into details but we recently released um also a python version of our content where we use uh, pandas and uh, numpy and you can of course do exactly the same thing that i just showed you in the r code uh, using python um so um it if you feel overwhelmed by pandas, that's that, that's okay. It has a very different um, uh, syntax, but still we try to use the same principles uh, of composition uh, and, and and chaining uh, operations. All right, um, a few slides of advertisement. Uh, I mentioned that we have the blog. Um, feel free to check it out. Um, we're still in the initial phase. Um, but the, the, we have uh, a couple of external contributions. For instance, uh, Björn Hagströmer and Niklas Landsberg have recently published something on uh, conducting tidy market microstructure research. Um, so provide a lot of details how to compute measures for in this area. Um, Ian Gao has wrote a post about using DuckDB uh, to work with the WRDS data. Um, and I have also, um, written a short post about uh, Pharma French uh, three and five factors and some, some differences that I discovered. So if you also want to uh, have an idea, if you want to contribute something, um, feel free to reach out, uh, check out our website uh, and, and get in touch. Um, second piece of advertisement. So it's not just me who maintains this website. Uh, as I said, it's important for us to have external contributions, but we, we we review the, the the input and we make sure that the content is up to date. Um, and it's so yeah, it's it's me, Stefan Voigt, and Patrick Weiss, who I got to know during my PhD studies at the Vienna Graduate School of Finance. And recently, Christoph Frey, who was in Hamburg, uh, also joined us as our Python expert. And last piece of advertisement. Uh, we have written the Tidy Finance with R book uh, that was published to CLC Press last year. 
Um, and the tidy finance with Python book is forthcoming in July of this year. Unfortunately, we don't have the nice cover yet. So this is why you have this pixelated ugly cover, but of course we have created a new uh, cover image. It's just not, the production team has not implemented it yet. Um, we are very happy to, to uh, have written these, these books. Um, but and we're also transparent that the website is more up to date to the books. So whenever we come across some innovation or uh, some some bugs or errors, we uh, immediately update the website. So by now that uh, the tidy finance with our book might be on some uh, occasion be a bit outdated, but more or less the content is still is still the same. All right, with this idea of Tidy finance uh, in mind, let's go to the main uh, body of today's uh, webinar, uh, which is the topic of accessing and managing uh, financial data. Uh, there are many data sources out there for the financial um, and the financial domain, and I'm definitely not going to cover all of them. Um, in this webinar, neither are we covering them, all of them in, in our book. We, we have selected those that we think are most important from an academic uh, point of view. So what you typically use during your studies or uh, as a teacher or researcher in uh, financial economics. But let's start with the, why are we doing this? Or what, what's the challenge here? Um, we, we want to highlight that it's really important to organize your data efficiently, in particular when you work on multiple projects over time or at the same time or with uh, co-authors um, who also code. And, and if you pull multiple data sources together, you might come across the challenge that, that it's it be hard to ensure the consistency across those data sources. I mean, one of those consistency issues might be just related to the column names. Um, they, they have wisely different uh, conventions out there. And the solution that we put forward is that, so is that R is a great tool to import, prepare and store data from basically any source that you can imagine. Um, and the second point is that we think that SQ uh, Light is a great um, database um, format tool to organize uh, uh, the data because it's very easy to install. But we'll get back to that uh, later. So in today's um, presentation, um, I will use mostly these R packages that are list here. So for the manipulation, it's the tidyverse, uh, but mostly it's dplyr and tidyr. Um, and for the data import, I will show examples from tidyquant. Uh, there's also a French data package that we really like and uh, read Excel to read Excel files. And it's a storage technology, as I said before, we use um, SQLite. So let's start with the first, um, the, with the first data source. Um, and bear with me, I know it will be, there will be a lot of, will be very cold and data heavy, but this is, I think, as we, we announced it, accessing and managing financial data. Towards the end of the presentation, I will include a few more graphs to, to slowly to ease out. Um, so the first data source, and I think for, for everybody who's, has experience with uh, with the financial domain uh, the, the, is familiar with that um, the pharma French factors and portfolio. So this is one of the most uh, it is the most popular data for asset pricing tests since pharma and French published their paper in 1993. The idea here is that they constructed uh, portfolios and. Uh, and the idea is, can these portfolios explain the cross-section of uh, stock returns? Um, 
And whenever you have a new idea, uh, I have a new factor that might explain the cross-section of uh, uh, um, stock returns, you typically take the Pharma French data and uh, evaluate whether you provide any new explanatory power. Um, so as you see in this code chunk here, um, we use the French data package. We think it's it's a it's a it's a great resource. Uh, it's it's a, it's a bit faster than copy pasting uh, all these uh, uh, URLs yourself. But what it and then the cool thing is, I think, is that it really downloads the raw data um, because it does not do any manipulations. So you can do everything yourself. Um, but actually, when you so if you use this data all the time, it actually makes sense to you know clean it properly so that you can have, have a nice data structure and also recall that the data should be uh, tidy. Um, so what we do in this example, if you focus on this mutate block here is first, and that's a very common thing, dates come in, in horrible forms, <laughs> anything you can imagine. So what we do here is we create a month column uh, as you see in, in the data below, that just takes the first day of the month consistently uh, um, for each uh, row. Second, um, as you see in this, uh, that the second um, mutate part here, the Pharma French data is in percentage points, which is might be confusing if you can, if you calculate returns yourself uh, at other uh, with other data. So what we do here is actually that we want to have proper numerical values. So we divide them by uh, 100. Um, and then for our personal preference, we like having uh, column names in lowercase and words connected with, with underscore. I mean, you have might have your own preference, that, that's fine. Um, but we decided to stick to that and also to use this convention consistently. So what we do is we rename all the columns to lowercase um, and then also the market access return we rename manually um, because it's market access is more expressive than having MKT minus RF as a, as a uh, column name. So what you see at the bottom is uh, our understanding of what the tidy Pharma French factor data uh, should look like. So the columns are variables. So we have the month, we have uh, market access returns, this, this small minus big, high minus low, and the risk free rate. Um, and month, so in each row is a month. So if you want to combine this, this, this data with uh, another source that is growing in importance, uh, so it's the, the, the Q factors, um, that's a recent alternative to the Pharma French data. Um, you see that this is, comes also in a very different format. So what we do here is, is um, you, we directly read a CSV file from an URL. And I think this is a great feature that you can just do this in R. You don't have to manually download things. You can just use the URL and uh, download it directly to your uh, R session. Um, and again, the first step is you need to convert the, the this uh, year and month to proper dates because, because we think that having the proper dates is, is important. Um, and then we also do a couple of naming transformations uh, to, to get these uh, lowercase um, um, column names and also percentage values. So just as an, an inspiration for you, if you're doing this asset pricing tests, we encourage you to also look at the Q factors. Um, and again, we have a nice tidy data format where the column names are also a bit different from uh, what you have in, in the Pharma French um, data. But we think this also makes sense because on a theoretical level, those, those, those columns are also um, uh, different.
the next data source that I want to show you, um, because it also has a different approach, how you get this data into your R session, um, are a set of uh, macroeconomic predictors um, by, by uh, Goyal and Welch. Um, they have uh, released this data for the first time, uh, I think in 2008. Um, it's just a collection of different macroeconomic uh, variables that you can use for equity premium prediction. We also use it in our book um, to do uh, a machine learning uh, application to select factors that, 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 that price assets. Why I wanted to show this example is, is because in this case you cannot um, directly read from a URL because it's uh, actually, it's an, an Excel spreadsheet stored in a Google Drive. Um, so it's a bit um, co confusing for, for, for R. So what you have to do here is actually first download the file with the download file function, store it. I mean, here I store it just as a, as a macro predictors uh, XLSX file. Um, and then you can start reading it in and doing several cleaning steps and variable transformations that I'm not showing here uh, uh, today. But just as an inspiration for you, if you have data sources that you cannot directly use read CSV or some other read function, um, you can always use uh, download the file in your script, uh, store it, and then then read it. Um, and we think this is this is also a very very nice feature. Um, yes, and again here it's it's very simple. The then you have uh, similar to the other data uh, we have cleaned the column names. One row is one month, and uh, but here are way more variables. I'm not going to go into details here. Okay, um, I want to highlight that there are so many other uh, macroeconomic variables out there that you can use for your um, for your research and uh, most notable i think that the federal reserve economic data um, database so the fred database um, is a great resource there are more than 10,000 data sets uh, available um, and what's nice is that the tidy quant package that i've also already shown in one of the initial slides, has uh, a built-in support for uh, for the downloading data from the thread database. So again, you can use the tq get, so tidy quant get function, um, input your desired um, data source here. We download the consumer price index that we also use in our book. And by specifying the economic uh, data, uh, source you you will uh, it tidy quant knows that it has to get the data from from Fred. Um, and here actually we don't have to do much computation or column cleaning because they also have the same uh, convention as we do. Uh, we just instead of having a, a end of date, we convert it to the, the first of the month because this is how we consistently uh, use a month in our applications. Uh, and we calculate the consumer price index relative to um, the last month uh, of the uh, of the time series. But that's again, that's just our convention. So we think that the tidy quant is also a great resource to to um, download data. Now let's move on to the point of data storage. So in our, I mean, as you know, from your own experience, probably there are many ways to store data. Um, I guess everybody has written CSV files. Um, they are somewhat uh, good, better than Excel uh, uh, notebooks at least. Um, but we think that if you, that, that going, uh, playing around with databases also pays off in the long term, in particular, because it's so easy to set up. 
So what you see in this code chunk here is that we use the RSQ Lite package, which is very lightweight um, to um, uh, create the database, and we use the dbplyr package to interact with the database. Um, creating the database can you can do this within your R session, and I think this is a big advantage of uh, SQLite. Um, at least relative to uh, uh, other non-serverless um, uh, database engines. So you can just, if you connect here, what we do is we, we connect to the Tidy Finance R SQLite um, database. And if it does not exist, then this uh, code uh, creates the database. Um, we also use the extended types uh, option here, uh, because uh, if you use that, then the SQLite database is also able to preserve dates for writing and getting them back out of the database again. Um, but I guess talk for dates, I think we can do a, a separate uh, webinar only talking about dates in different programming languages and um, data storage technologies. But at least for our use case, it helps us to to be consistent across the locations. And if you want to write to the database, um, there's the DB write table function. And for instance, if we want to write the factors, the pharma French three factors, the monthly ones that we've downloaded uh, before to the database, uh, to the tidy finance database, <clears throat> we can also just give it the same name in the database um, this this table, um, and it's I think it's uh, it's a very very lean uh, operation, and if you want to um, load this data again from the database, you can. I mean, also there are also other approaches. You can use the DB read table um, operation uh, function, but here we use the DB plier package, and just use the table function, telling it to access the the finance database and pull information about the, uh, the table that we've just written in there. And if you use the collect function, then you have it again in your memory. Um, so this is the typical workflow that we also use in the book. We, we download the data, we, we clean it, we make sure that the column names uh, uh, are aligned. We make sure that the format is tidy again, each column is a variable, each row is an observation, and then we store it to the database. Because in later applications, we do not want to take care of all this data cleaning again and again. Um, so if you're working on multiple projects with the same core data, it makes sense to do it once properly, clean everything, store it, and then reuse that storage for other projects. You might wonder why why SQLite? Um, we think the big pros are twofold. So first, it's a lightweight self-contained serverless database engine. So this means you can just install it with this one. I mean, you can just install the package so that you don't have to install any other dependencies. Um, and this, as you've seen in the code chunk before, it's very easy to create this database um, because this RSQLite package just uh, initializes the database. You do not need your own server and all kinds of, so, so database management can get very uh, complicated very quickly. Um, and the second big plus is that it is great for education purposes and prototyping. So also in my company, we frequently use SQLite database just to quickly set something up that doesn't have a heavy load, but just to get things running and to stick to this SQL uh, thinking, it, it makes sense to force yourself. Um, uh, it makes sense to force yourself to SQL thinking if you also have uh, production technologies that use SQL. But I just want to mention that there are also big cons of uh, SQLite, um, in particular, when you have very large data, um, it, it it might become slow, and I, I don't. This is definitely not the most efficient solution to to deal with very large data. And concurrency is also an issue. So if you want to SQLite to in 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 jobs, 
or in applications where you have a high degree of parallelization, then you have to uh, tinker it a bit to, to make it work. But uh, ideally, you can switch to uh, other technologies. Um, and the second con that I want to highlight is that um, with this approach that I've just shown you before, it might be a bit cumbersome to transfer the data over to other languages um, using the SQLite uh, database engine. For instance, using the same database in R and Python might be a bit of a pain in particular when it comes to dates. Um, I have written a blog post about that if you if you if you are interested about this how different uh, data storage technologies handle dates in R and Python. I'm happy to 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 share that with you. Okay, with this in mind, SQLite is very simple to install, very easy to manage locally on your computer. Um, there are many open source data sets out there. I've just shown you a few examples. Um, unfortunately, one of the, the, the most important data sources in um, the academic research community and in teaching uh, is uh, closed source. And it's also an important part of our book. Um, I, will, I will, so I want to, to, to highlight this also in today's webinar. Um, so we will talk now about WRDS. So you might wonder what WRDS is. Um, it's the, the it's it stands for the Wharton Research Data Services, and it is, I think, the most popular provider of financial and economic data in the academic domain. So it has a focus on, on, on uh, academic uh, audiences and, and research applications. Um, and it's so they have a lot of data, a, a lot of tables. So if you dig into the, if you go into this, the details of WRDS, it's, it's just crazy how many things that they have there. Um, so they obviously do not use an SQLite database, they, they use another database engine, namely uh, PostgreSQL. And it's fortunately very easy to access that using the R Postgres package. Um, I'm not gonna show you any more code here. Uh, it's, it's very similar to um, what we've seen with the SQLite, but you just change the, the driver basically and the, and the target. So you can find more details on our Tidy Finance uh, website. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very similar to, to, to pull uh, data from there. Um, just to list our data sources, um, it would take way, uh, would take up way too much time to, to go into details for each of them. Um, but the, the most, the, the ones that we use in our book, and we think are also the most important ones in, in, in the financial research. Uh, first, the, the CRISP data set. So that's uh, basically historical monthly and daily returns for US stocks. I'm gonna show you some, some insights into that in a bit. Um, the second uh, very important data source is uh, CompuStat. There's, these are historical accounting data for US companies. So naturally, this is very useful information if you look into uh, asset pricing problems um, the third very important data source um, are characteristics of US uh, corporate bonds um, that we use in our book because we also combine it with the fourth data source that's, that's trace or we actually use enhanced trace. These are detailed US corporate bond uh, transactions. So you can actually uh, map those two things, which is really exciting. Um, just a brief glimpse into this CRISP uh, data. What you can see here are this, this the historical um, number of securities by listing exchange. I think this is already a, some an interesting insight. Um, so what you have here is since the 1960s, 
we have the number of stocks for the, the New York Stock Exchange, NICE, for, for the NASDAQ and for the Amex, for the American uh, Stock Exchange. Um, and yeah, for instance, what you see here that there are, um, in the 90s, we had a peak, uh, in the late 90s, we had a peak of stocks listed uh, on exchanges, in particular on the NASDAQ. We had more than 5,000 stocks on the NASDAQ, and at the moment we are around uh, below 3,000. And you can also see on this graph that, that Amex has steadily declined uh, over time. There's also the other category, but to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what's in there. It's just a handful of stocks, actually. Um, but yeah, so this is this is this is a great data resource. So if you can use that for your research or for your uh, for your studies, um, you can do a lot of historical analysis. So that's that's really great. And our tidy finance uh, approach. Um, provides you the guidance how to to uh, prepare that data and how to work with it. I also want to briefly mention the, the historical bond data. It's just a quick clip, uh, glimpse. Um, this is the snapshot that we used uh, in our book. So these are bonds between 2014 and to end of 2016. Um, and in this data, there are more than uh, 13 or 14,000 bonds uh, outstanding towards the end of the sample. Um, and if you look at the trading data, it's also there are more than there around 8,000 uh, bonds, bonds traded in that period. Actually, I have to, like, we have to extend this figure at some point because I think it would be informative to have more uh, recent uh, numbers. But as you can imagine, this. Uh, at least the, the transaction or the, the, the trading data becomes huge if you look at, uh, at uh, way, uh, if you look at a big uh, sample period. But of course, with R, you can also do that um, if you want to. Um, I've briefly mentioned that there are, of course, many other data sources out there. Um, in fact, we think that there's a large ecosystem of, of, of data providers. Um, we, when we wrote the book, we, we tried to compile a list of our packages. Um, and since then we are continuously expanding it. Um, so just to list a few examples that I did not talk about uh, today, um, but I mean, you can directly access the, the, the FRED database that I've mentioned uh, using the FRED R package. If you want to have European macroeconomic data, there is the ECB package. Um, Quandl is also a very important um, uh, uh, data source. And I think the Telequant package uses some of Quandl's uh, uh, endpoints uh, and, and, and many more. I mean, also for Bloomberg or DataStream or whatever, there are R packages for, for most um, data sources. Um, and also we list, uh, there are also, for, of course, for crypto data, there are also data sources. Uh, we actually don't don't really talk about this data in, in our book yet. If you take a look at our uh, list and if you think that we are missing an important package, maybe your package that you wrote and you think this should be on that list, then please reach out to us uh, using our uh, contact at tidyfinance.org or you also find it on, on the website, how to, to reach us. We are happy to, to extend this list. Um, so, and with this, actually, we, we arrive at the end of today's webinar. Um, I hope I've given you an overview of what, what the Tidy Finance Project is about and some inspiration for how financial data uh, can be cleaned and why it is important to to, to clean that and, and ensure consistency. Um, I want to close today by, by mentioning that we have also just yesterday released a package to, to Khan, um, the Tidy Finance R package. Um, it's, the idea is that it provides a couple of helper functions um, for, the, for people who are familiar with 
the tidy finance with R. Um, in particular, all these download and cleaning steps are uh, packaged into uh, functions that do all these operations. You do not have to copy the code from our website all the time if, if you use this data at, at different uh, projects. So for instance, um, the example that I'm giving you here, you can just install the package now that it's hosted on, 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 on Khan using the install packages. And for instance, if you want to download the Chris monthly data from WRDS, you can just call the tidy finance download data function and it internally also uh, establishes a connection. Of course, you need your own credentials for that. And it performs all these cleaning steps that we have in the book and just spits out the final data for you. Um, and we are, uh, yes, we are very happy to receive uh, feedback about this package. So it's just the first release. So it has very limited functionality, but we decided to, to have limited uh, features um uh, initially because we're not sure in which direction we should extend the package so we really rely on 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 your feedback on where we sh what we should do with this uh, package um yeah and just three uh, main takeaways for the end um so we provide detailed open source material on tidyfinance.org if you want to learn about financial applications yourself or if you are a teacher. There are materials there. Um, if you need teaching materials such as slides or uh, solution manuals, please just get in touch uh, with us. We are also very happy to learn who's using which material, where, so and also collect uh, feedback on that level. Um, if you have an idea, that would be a good fit for our blog. Um, feel free to reach out at an early stage, not when you have written the blog post, but before you will write the blog post. Um, and for instance, if, if you're a master student and you want to showcase your work in a different format than your master thesis, we can, you can also use our blog. Uh, and last but not least, um, if you want to get updates on the tidy finance front, feel free to follow me for news uh, on LinkedIn. Um, with my Christoph Scheuch name. So thank you very much. And now I'm uh, looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, yeah, okay. So I see that there are already some questions uh, answered. Um, and there's one uh, open. Why is other, uh, why does other correspond to null on the first graph? Okay, null, yes, it's, uh, so the question is actually about this one. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not zero. Um, it's just very, very small. This is why um, it's actually, this is why it looks like a flat line <laughs> around zero. Um, and it's a good point that you raise it. I think for the future, we, we, we could even think about excluding that one, in particular in presentations. I think it raises more questions than it, it answers. Okay. Any more uh, questions? No open questions at the moment. Um, maybe I can fill the time in in uh, still by some anecdotes. Um, actually, so this 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 I mentioned initially that the tidy finance project emerged. Um, out of our own issues that we had with the data, um, but but in, so initially, I, I actually I wrote a couple of blog posts um, in the final year of my graduate studies, because for me it was already clear that I'm not I'm not going to stay in academia and I wanted to go to the industry, and I figured that I have no idea how asset pricing works, 
and I wrote blog posts how to replicate the famous Bali and Engel book on cross-section of returns in asset pricing. I'm not exactly sure about the title. Um, and I just put them online because I figured it's it's I would have liked this information out there. And then, yeah, over time, I, I received um, emails of people thanking me for putting these things online. And from there on, I think then, yeah, Stefan, Patrick, and I figured let's let's make more more out of these blog posts because there are people who who would uh, like that. Okay, we have a new open question. What kind of background in R and finance is recommended for getting the most out of your book and other materials? So, I mean, to be to be honest, our book is neither an R beginner nor a finance beginner uh, uh, audience book. So. Ideally, you have some previous um, have set, had some previous exposure to to program with R, um, and ideally you also have some had a basic introduction to finance course. So we are not we are not, for instance, the the, the capital asset pricing model, the cap M, uh, is part of our book. We do not go through the details of the cap m this is not the this is not what what we want to do uh, in our book we really want to bring people who have already some some knowledge bring them to the next level so in particular master students uh, in, in in business or finance and graduate uh, graduate students um, but then on the other hand my, my my colleague stefan he teaches the book to to uh, i think master students in copenhagen who do not have uh, previous r experience and they still manage to to solve exercises but at least they have the finance background so and we think this is also a power of the the, the tidy diverse um and the, this human-centered coding approach that you can write accessible code that people understand even if they don't have a programming background. So so maybe long story short to answer your question, I think the, the finance having some finance background is 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 valuable for to, to really get the most out of our book. Um and the R the R uh, uh background can easily so the R knowledge can easily be learned on the on the job, so to say. Okay. Um, um, maybe another another anecdote. So the the how did we come up with the Python the Python approach? Um, so initially we were really convinced that R R and is the best way to do it in in finance, but it uh, turns out that in the industry that many people prefer to use Python. Um, and actually, but people were still interested in our in our approach to to um, financial economics. So people started translating our stuff the code, the R code to Python. And we figured, okay, before other people do it and before people use ChatGPT to translate stuff uh, without any uh, quality checks, we um, decided, okay, we should do it ourselves and really properly make sure that the results uh, align. Have you looked, okay, we have a new question. Um, have you looked at adding a chapter on building shiny apps with financial data? So, um we will most certainly not do that because we think first uh, there's a great resource on shine oh uh, there are many great resources on on shiny apps if you want to get into that um the, so Hadley Wickham has a book on mastering shiny for instance um and it 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 would just create there's a lot of overhead involved with 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 shiny apps, uh, and I think that would just go beyond the scope of our of our book. Um, having said that, if you are doing research uh, with financial data, 
I think it really pays off to also dig into uh, shiny apps because you can really make uh, your results also provide an interface to your results and give the give give people just a new uh, way to interact with uh, results. So summing up, we are not planning on doing that, and yeah, we decided to not. Uh, include chapters on, on shiny apps and other publishing formats. I mean, Quarto could also be um, um, is also a valid way to to share your uh, results. Um, just because we don't have the expertise and the, the the book would explode, but nonetheless, we think these are great great things to learn. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm actually, I mean, if you if you're into tidy tidy stuff in general, um, not just the tidy verse, but I think you can also approach tidy coding in in Python and Julia. Um, I, I once again want to invite you to follow me on on LinkedIn, um, because there I'm sharing also content. Um, in addition to tidy finance, so I have my own blog called uh, Tidy Intelligence, where um, I write more about cross language um, uh, comparisons. But I think since we are ending, are we approaching the end of today's uh, webinar? Um, I think we can close it for today. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for for participating, for attending. Uh, it's a great experience for me to present this material for the first time. And yeah, thanks again to the our consortium. And yeah, hopefully people reach out to me or us and send to me via LinkedIn. Thank you, Christoph. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye.